Grow CFO is where finance leaders grow together. Join thousands of like-minded professionals using Grow CFO to access the combined knowledge and experience of the finance leader community. You can join us today at growcfo.net. Hello and welcome to the Grow CFO show. I'm your host, Kevin Appleby, and today I've got the CEO of Received with me, Roy Ben Daniels. Roy, welcome to the Grow CFO show. Hey, Kevin, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Roy, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. In terms of academic background, I studied the law and accounting, ended up not really pursuing uh, neither, but it's funny how life is serendipitous. And I, I always say everything uh, has a use. And uh, although I didn't quite take the accounting route, now I'm a heavy user of that accounting knowledge base. I also did my master's with the University of uh, Chicago, a pretty finance-focused uh, uh, school in uh, building and uh, working in uh, fintech uh, for over a decade now, pretty much uh, most of my uh, career. I spent six years at Visa, where I set up the partnerships team, Tel Aviv. It's basically a biz dev sales team working with fintechs. Those were the early days of Visa and MasterCard working with non-traditional financial institutions and that was the golden era of fintech. We can touch on that uh, later if you want. Pretty exciting time. We grew that activity from non-existent to tens of millions of uh, dollars in revenue, working with the high growth fintechs. I was also part of uh, Visa Ventures, led a couple of deals, and always uh, want to be at the helm and uh, start something on my own. Working with fintechs and technology companies, I was uh, really hand-holding CEOs and then uh, senior executives in uh, how to go to market. And I got a great look into the back office of these uh, companies. That's kind of what led me into the B2B space and billing and quota cash uh, specifically. Okay. So what exactly does your fintech do? Uh, let me uh, start with the philosophy and how we view the market. We think there is a whole lot to do in the organizational software space, specifically in the CFO stack. If you look at the last decade, a ton of capital and ideas and resources and talent went into building for the organizations. I think for many reasons, uh, marketing and sales and IT and HR got the majority of that investment and the CFO stack was kind of uh, left behind. And I think we're seeing a renaissance of investment into the CFO stack after 15, 20 years of stagnation. We believe that within the CFO stack, and actually also in organizations, verticalization is going to be a major part of the evolution. Because if you think of the CFO stack, I like the analogy of the sun and the planets, the sun being ERP and accounting. Those yep. are generic systems, you know, your SAP, NetSuite, QuickBooks, Zero, whatever it may be. I don't think they're going to go away anytime uh, soon. And for good reason, they're doing a great job. But there's going to be those planets that I talked about, payroll, FP&A, billing and quote to cash, for example, that are going to be much more verticalized because... Just to give an example of what I mean, within billing a quote to cash, your size really mandates which software you need. And more than that, your category and products and services that you sell really change the quote to cash process. So if you think about inventory or non-inventory, if you think about a marketplace versus a sales-led B2B, a B2C, those uh, system needs are totally different. So getting back to uh, answering uh, your question, we think there is no good system that does billing and quote to cash for B2B sales led. The problem there is that we call it, uh, we like uh, nicknames and analogies. I don't know if you picked up on that. We nickname it the revenue spaghetti, which means bespoke contracts, negotiation led uh, contracts, make each contract a snowflake complex pricing, and also a slew of uh, channels and SKUs as you grow really makes it hard for B2B sales-led organization uh, to automate. So we are building build billing for B2B sales-led, but eventually, and I'm going to finish here, eventually, I think what's really needed is a cash flow and revenue management system 
for those type of businesses. Okay. So cash flow and revenue management. So your system received is looking at those things. Yes, it all starts with the operations. AR and quote to cash are pretty complex processes. I think that within the CFO stack and also in the software world or just in the business world in general, what we're also seeing is a consolidation. You see it in sales engagement tools, for example. Now, Apollo, for example, we're using Apollo for sales engagement and we love Apollo. It pretty much does everything. It started with a niche and now it, it does a lot. And we see the same thing happening in billing and AR. And, you know, your guess is good as mine. My guess would be a ton of cash was poured into the market, uh, more competitive pressure combined with this pretty hard market where people are trying to cut down on uh, software purchases uh, really makes the product bar much higher. So you need to do more in one platform. So what I'm getting at is that you need to do a lot of things within the AR and billing process in order to get to that cash flow and revenue management view and control and management. And it's really hard to do that across five different systems. We believe that one system should do that for a type of organization, in our case, a B2B organization. Does that make sense? That makes sense. But if you're talking about cash flow, cash flow forecasting, isn't there a lot more than just AR going into that? Don't you need to have a system that is bridging between not just receivables, but payables, payroll, anything else that might be causing an inflow or an outflow of cash? Yeah, of course. It should have been more specific. It's income and cash flow that really we see. There's actually an interesting discussion about AP and AR. Are they going to merge? Because you do see some of these platforms like Bill.com, for example, which is really an AP platform for small businesses, by the way, if we talked about those, you know, which CFO, which type of organization you're building for. But in any case, Build.com, really an AP platform, is doing some AR, and there's a ton of examples for that. But I don't think we're going to see that type of merger and acquisition activity happening uh, real soon because there's so much to be done on either side, and there yeah. are totally different processes and totally different mechanics. But I do mean uh, income and cash flow and revenue. Yeah. Talking about fintech taking a, a becoming a bigger part of the vertical, individual fintechs. Over the last few years, there have been a lot of startups. You're one of many in your organization. Given that the current pressure on available funding, higher interest rates and so on, do you think there's going to be a fallout of fintechs in the near future? Yeah, of course, there's going to be a major one. Two thoughts about this. One is a zoom out one and one is a zoom in one. The zoom out thought is, I think fintech in many senses is an industry in a identity crisis. I see still many founders and investors talk about the same thesis and opportunities and categories that some of them are crowded. Some of them are just not that relevant or they failed to really fulfill the prophecy or the promise. I can mention insurance and banking. I think the stuff that, hap that eventually happened in the market wasn't really what uh, startups and investors really hoped for. I'm not sure anyone knows really what's going to be the next step of fintech. So I think there's, there's really uh, the theme or kind of the motivation in fintech. I think that's kind of a work in progress. I think we're moving on to a next uh, fintech generation. On the organizational level, if you talk about market pressures and stuff like that, I think that founders and organizations that aren't automating and don't understand that you need to build for now and you need to build wide with multiple capabilities are not going to make it. And that's our philosophy at, uh, at Received. Okay. You're concluding in a little bit the same way as I am, that there's going to be a fallout 
I suppose that's going to put some pressure on the, the CFO to be with the right technical stack. How would you be advising the CFO in terms of his tech stack at the moment? Yeah, well, I'm not objective, but uh, <laughs> I can tell you that I really like a blog by uh, Tina Dimitrova, who's an investor at uh, Bain Capital uh, uh, Ventures. We also, we were on a panel together earlier this year in, in New York. She talks about the CFO waves, the post-Enron CFO, the more process and transparency oriented the CFO. I think the second wave was around growth. And the third wave is the, she calls it the CXO, the chief of everything officer, someone who's very strategic, but also someone who is a system architect. There's a couple of things there. First of all, we see millennials becoming CFOs and VP finance and finance leaders. And I think that generation is a bit more tech savvy and is grew into using technology in organizations. So I think there's much more willingness in adopting technology in the organization. And the other part of it is what we touched about uh, before. It's all about efficiency. Spreadsheets, it's always funny to me that uh, people are fighting spreadsheets. I mean, spreadsheets are fine when you're small, but from a certain stage, you got to have technology that creates data consistency, for example. You know, your CRM and ERP should have the same data. We see organizations that have such discrepancy, you know. Every little question becomes half a day of a project to answer. And, you know, that can be at the tip of your fingers with systems. I mean, not to talk about headcount, but it's much more than headcount. It's just being about a smarter with running uh, your business, that technology that accumulates pretty fast. The, the worst solution, by the way, finish with that thought, the worst solution that we see some B2B CFO is doing is building in-house, specifically in our category. Again, not objective here. I am drinking my own Kool-Aid, but I do believe that. And we, we see this in the data that invoicing, when you really reduce it, it can seem like a very simple thing, but it's not. It has a lot going into it, a lot of processes, a lot of data coming in and out. And businesses that are now, you know, really invested with a team of five, four software engineers that maintain and keep improving their invoices system, which is buggy, and the finance team hates. If you think about what's the cost of four or five software engineers just to run invoicing, the math is pretty simple. It's a subpar solution with a 4x, 5x, 10x, whatever cost. So that would probably be the, the worst, worst case scenario building in-house. Yeah, I can certainly see that. I, I've never been a great fan of building in-house. saw that a long, long time ago, back in the 1990s. I was working ICI, the number one in the FTSE 100, doesn't exist anymore. And we built in-house the corporate accounting system. Having rejected a system that was being put together by some folk in ICI Germany that later became SAP. <laughs> <laughs> now, huge undertaking and hundreds of people involved in it. But there was no ERP at the time. Yeah. There's ERP now. And it's just not worth that internal investment. Not at all. I'm actually surprised you're still finding people that are building their own invoicing systems. What in particular would drive somebody to build their own versus building a, buying a solution off the shelf? It happens usually when you give up on you give up on, on the market. Some, you know, just don't know what's out there, but I think mostly what we see is people saying we all think we're special, right? So everyone thinks yeah. they're an edge case. Twenty years of consulting told me that every client thinks they're special. We really? are. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge with B two B, which is sales led again, because there's B two B and B two C are it's not really the best division or the way to think about it. Really, the way I think about it is self serve and sales led because self serve doesn't matter if you're it, you're selling to small businesses or consumers, it has the same go-to-market motion. You know, right. you need to bring people to your website and then you have a pretty rigid pricing and you need to manage for high volume of uh, customers. 
paying usually with a credit card on a recurring basis. But if you pick up two customers within a tier, they're going to look alike. I mean, at least what you need to do with them is going to look alike. And, you know, in that space, Zuora and Chargebee, who do subscription management, are doing a great job. But in sales-led, there's so much complexity because, again, we said each contract is a snowflake. And pricing is so much more complex and it varies. There, companies are saying, you know, they look at solutions and they say, I'm so complex, I can't even think of a system that can meet me where I am. And guess what? That is an opportunity. When people are willing to invest, they need a solution, but they say there's no solution that really meets me where I am at my complexities, you know. That's what we see leading to that decision. I can see that completely. And I think that is more than correct that the, the B2C, B2B split is not right. Uh, we're looking at both in Grow CFO. We're selling things to individuals. We're also selling things to finance teams. And by and large, we want automation. We want an automatic sale. We want the credit card going in, paying for it, and then the system's automatically in the background giving access to the appropriate training course or the appropriate platform or the appropriate PDFs or whatever it is that the, the person's bought. Or, or if it's a boot camp, you know, set up the diary appointments for the boot camp workshops automatically. Send them the email joining instructions automatically. So, yeah, I definitely see that. That split as, is this all automated? Or is the manual process a very real differentiator? And I, I suppose I've never been in a position that I've seen anything that's on, on the sales-led side that doesn't take you kind of into having a, an accounts receivable function. You'll give them an invoice. It'll be payable after a certain period. If it's not paid, you've then got to go chase the debt. Certainly that side of things is is very different to the way we want to run a business where everything's paid for up front. Yes, it is a very different bucket of requirements and system specs. And if you look at what's happening in the market, I think that the future of businesses is even more complex. What's happened is, again, we, we talked about competitive pressure of capital influx coming into specifically software businesses. We're seeing lines uh, getting blurred between B2B and B2C, as we just talked about. OpenView coined the term product-led growth, and we see businesses doing hybrid pricing, doing both that and sales-led. We, we see so many businesses with like, you know, 80% sales-led and 20% of revenue comes uh, from a long tail of PLG of self-serve. And that's Grow CFO. You give a great example. You're using technology to diversify the products and services that you make available to the market, and technology is enabling that. But that also requires different pricing models because you bring to the market different products and services. So that's where the fun is, really untangling and solving for that complexity. I think you also got something going on in a much more competitive marketplace that says, well, hang on, there's a base product that we want to sell people and we want to make it nice and affordable. So it's not really a tough decision. So we're not losing sales. But then there's all these add-ons we want to add on to the base product. And therefore, even the sort of billing that you might do, go and buy it on the website. How do you figure that into the billing system? Because it's probably not just a click one button, buy here. There could be a gold, silver, and bronze version of whichever product you're putting together. And you're increasingly seeing that when you're buying software on websites. Yeah, that's the other part of the market. We really focus on where the contract is a high ACV, you sell to enterprises, you have negotiation, a sales order is messy. What we see, for example, with the finance teams, there's actually a, quite a lot of friction between finance and sales, which is sometimes it's amusing. Sometimes there's a healthy rivalry because sales are going to go out and sell, which is what they need to do. And then they get another first one to say that the sales teams get, to, how should we say it, a bit creative. Selling. The accounting team as the sale prevention department. <laughs> you know, they go back 
to finance teams go back to these PDFs, these sales orders, which you go back to products and services and the timeline and quantity and pricing, that experience really hurts. When you do that in scale, if you're a small, you're still growing early, early growth, you have 10 customers, you're going to be fine. But when you do that at scale, at tens of millions of dollars, I mean, visibility is hurt, business agility is hurt, capital efficiency is hurt. That complexity is not being answered in the market. And received then, what does your ideal customer look like? B2B software, there's not huge differences within B2B software, which is sales-led between customers. So it's not like we focus on specific categories. Although some categories have a bit more complexity than others, for example, AI that what now we're seeing emerging tends to adopt more of a usage-based pricing that we also provide support for. But it's B2B software, it's mid-market, it's anyone as a broad benchmark, anyone below 50 employees is probably... Fine with sticking with QuickBooks, you know, you don't need to automate at that stage when you have like $3 million in AR, you don't need to automate. Stick to the spreadsheets and QuickBooks, you'll be fine. But uh, really what we're answering for is mid-market. And by the way, if I may say so, that's also a bit of God is in the details. And I think people don't talk enough about the size of the customer because the category, okay, that's one part of it, but SMB and mid-market and actually enterprise need different systems. Mid-market and enterprise don't need the same systems. Enterprise need a whole lot of uh, customizations. They need implementation is going to take a year. With mid-market, you got to be up and running in a week or two, and you got to have a system which is both kind of enterprise ready, but also consumer grade. And I think if you look at corporate spend with Mesh and Brex and Ramp, where they really took a stronghold, where their success lies, is a mid-market, not really with enterprise and not really with SMBs. So going back to your question, our ICP is our ideal customer is mid-market, B2B software. Okay. You must see a lot of mid-market CFOs. Yes. What do you feel about what's worrying the average mid-market CFO at the moment? Runway <laughs> in software, yeah. runway. It's runway and capital raise, but that's kind of a run-of-the-mill thing that everyone's experiencing. I think if you get down to the details, people are really looking at their customer base and rethinking strategies. So CAC, payback, and unit economics are a thing that yeah. people are thinking about because if you take a look at your customer cohort your CAC is not gonna look alike when you slice and dice it into different geographies and uh, customer types mm -hmm. and we see some CFO saying okay you know we're not gonna pursue this customer segment now because it doesn't make sense you know in yesterday's growth at all cost market you would pursue anyone but yeah. now there is a much more intelligent conversation about customer cohorts and what makes sense and who we say goodbye to. We even say that. The second thing that we're seeing is uh, rethinking pricing. We mentioned pricing uh, before, and, and this is specifically unique to B2B SaaS. There's kind of an um, ongoing discussion about subscription that came to prominence with, I think Adobe really made it uh, popular 15, 20 years ago. And really has been the sweetheart of the venture world, uh, but now usage has its own advantages. And there's kind of this uh, trade-off because the usage-based pricing, customers love it because customers want flexibility. We see customers now putting pressure on companies and on CFO saying, I'm not sure that I want to pay that 30K ACV upfront. Let me just pay as I go. So SaaS companies are being pressured by customers to adopt usage. On the other hand, the flip side of that is that investors are saying to companies that are usage heavy, adopt SaaS because usage heavy is being hurt because it doesn't provide that stability of SaaS, that recurring element. So CFOs are getting contradicting pressures for both uh, customers and investors. And definitely it leads them to rethink and being more flexible. Eventually what they do is open up options for their customers. 
Yeah, I suppose that's what I was getting at earlier when we are talking about seeing lots of different levels of service in the SaaS market now. You're not just going in and paying the one monthly fee. There are many more options arriving. It is almost giving you that usage-based model, but you're buying a bronze level of usage, a silver level or a gold level, and getting some of the flexibility while the, the supplier can, in a way, protect the ongoing revenues that investors like. Yeah, exactly. Another way to think about it, it, it's a game of leverage, really. When you have all the power in the world, you know, let's say you're on a monopoly, you can price whatever in however manner you like and set uh, one price and just have the whole world pay that price. But when you're in a competitive market, it's the buyer that really determines the terms that adds to the complexity. And also people are thinking about what am I not charging for? A classic example for that is services. I think many software companies tend out to give services for free. By the way, services is probably your highest cost if you look at unit economic in the business. What we're seeing with the software businesses, for example, is that they are rethinking what they can charge for that they haven't charged for before. If you think about it, services is a classic example for it. Even at economic basis, services is actually probably your highest cost element in, in your business, but I think it's still not in the DNA of growing companies to charge for that. And we're seeing pretty innovative ways in which companies are charging for services. So one example would be actually productizing your services, doing uh, re recurring services in tiers where you have a certain bank hour. And then if you go up above your tiers hour, you might uh, pay an overage. People are really thinking deeply about how they can maximize the commercial value of working with each individual customer. That was something that really we saw with a lot of companies way back before SaaS became a thing, that you were buying a license for a product, you loaded it up onto your internal server, not in the cloud, and you were paying the software supplier some kind of maintenance fee on an ongoing basis to maintain what you'd got. And that was a service rather than the software itself. We kind yeah. of come full circle on that one. Right? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. The best things do, so... <laughs> Well, that has been a fascinating look at what's going on in the, first of all, the AR space, and then in the space that your customers operate in. I think that'll be really interesting to a lot of our audience. Thank you very much for being this week's guest on the Grow CFO Show. Thank you, Kevin. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me.